All right. Good morning, folks. Welcome to the first fireside chat uh, put on by your GitLab technical account managers. My name is Andy Gunter. I am a technical account manager with GitLab. Hopefully everyone can hear me okay. Um, thank you all for joining. I see the attendee list growing. We have today a special speaker and goes by the name of John Northrup. He's a senior production engineer on GitLab.com. And so the topic today, uh, based on the questions fielded by the technical, technical account managers uh, from the likes of yourselves and other customers, uh, has to do with high availability. Uh, why do we need it? How do we do it? How does GitLab.com sustain the volume that it sustains and all of the good technical details in between? So let me quickly uh, go around the small virtual room here, uh, just make quick intros of folks on behalf of them. And <laughs> we have uh, Rupert Williams, who's a technical account manager covering East Coast. Uh, and some maybe Midwest, myself, Andy Gunter, uh, technical account manager, as I said, covering East Coast. We have John Northrup, uh, again, production engineer for GitLab.com. I think that covers it. Uh, don't want to spend too much time talking myself. So I'm going to let John jump into it, unless there are any other items to cover beforehand. Otherwise, I think you guys came to hear really on how this works. So we're going to start that off. John? Hey, folks. Uh, greetings from sunny Nashville, Tennessee. Uh, as Andy said, my name is John Northrup. I'm a senior production engineer that uh, takes care of running all of GitLab.com's infrastructure, as well as our internal infrastructure that we use to build GitLab.com and the on-prem product that you run uh, at your sites. So today's overview is just going to be a look at how we run GitLab.com, the architecture involved there, some of the things that we do to make that scale. And then I'd like to keep it on an informal basis so that you can ask questions as we go along through this. So in your session, you should have a Q&A function where you can actually ask questions and Andy will receive those and we'll kind of work through those. So this is a fireside chat, like Andy said. So I don't feel the need to reserve all the questions till the end. So as we're going along, I'm going to hit on some high-level things um, to kind of introduce you to our architecture, a look at how we do things. If you have questions as we're going along, feel free to ask them. Um, I have additional questions here, so that at the end, uh, if you don't have any questions, I'll st start working through some of these questions that your TAMs have submitted. Um, and so let's just dive right in. So today we're going to be covering a series of things, starting with our current GitLab architecture and overview. We're going to look at the components of state. So what is stateful in our architecture and what isn't stateful? What can you reboot anytime you want to and what do you need to have some gloves around? Uh, our HA configuration, so how do we scale what we scale? Uh, the scaling of GitLab in terms of what components can scale horizontally and what kind of scales vertically. Front end load balancing or how we apply our secret sauce. Uh, keeping track of it all, so how do we manage all this? And then keeping it running, so how are we monitoring this and what does that look like? So we'll start with our architecture. So GitLab.com uses a series of front-end load balancers. Those load balancers are our HA proxy load balancers, and we split the traffic that comes into those. So we have uh, a series of hosts that cover our API. We have our registry for our Docker images. We have our web for our UI front-end, and then we have our Git for our um, the Git interactions, be they HTTP or SSH based Git sessioning. So if you look at these, these are all the components that you would find inside your omnibus installation. Uh, we just kind of break them out. To look further at our database architecture, because we're going to cover that next, this is where we kind of get a little bit more complex. So we run Postgres as the internal database architecture for GitLab.com. Um, and then we run it with some of the high availability features that we're shipping in the Omnibus package. So we have Postgres with PG Bouncer in front of it for connection pooling. And then we're also using Rep Manager for adding dynamic Postgres nodes so we can know 
when we have one node or when we have three nodes. What we do with this is when we have three nodes, the other two nodes become followers of the leader. And then the internal GitLab application references things that are read queries. So updates on issues, comments and things like that, go to the primary, displays of those things though, where you're not actually updating them or writing data, you're just fetching data, those go to the follower SQL node. So this is how we can distribute SQL load. This is all part of Omnibus and we manage this through, like I said, PG Bouncer for connection pooling, Rep Manager for dynamic adding, dynamically adding things, and then we use uh, Console. So Console is a service discovery pro, uh, tool. Um, and so that's what we use to dynamically advertise when a SQL database node comes online, when it comes out of line. And that's how we kind of keep fluidity of this. The service discovery piece is going to be something that you see grow within the GitLab product. Um, the first place we started using this is in our database section. Um, we hope to scale it out to things like uh, Redis and web nodes and things like that. Um, but so this is the first place we've actually implemented it. So components of state, this can be fairly obvious depending upon how technically you are or not that obvious. Um, within GitLab, there are components that need to be mindful because the, the data that you're pushing there or pulling from there is stateful and it needs to have actions around it that maintain that state. Uh, so that you can have, you know, preserve the quality of your data and your application. There are other things in GitLab in the application that aren't stateful. So systems that need care, this would be our database storage and a system of record. Inside the Omnibus package, inside GitLab, the Postgres database is the system of record for everything. Everything from what your user ID is, to comments on an issue, to, you know, what the latest, uh, you know, hash ref is to be displayed of, of the, the Git repo that you're looking at. So this is all done in Postgres, and we balance it out with PG Bouncer for connection pooling. Those two systems need to have care when maintaining them. So any action you're gonna do that takes an action on the PG Bouncer or the Postgres database needs to be mindful of that because that is stateful replication that happens between the two with wall transaction logs between the Postgres nodes, um, as well as communication between the PG Bouncer to the Postgres database and then the application is talking to PG Bouncer about accessing the database. Uh, our work queue. So this would be Redis. So in most instances of Omnibus, you have a single Redis install. Redis is where all of the real-time transaction queue stuff comes from. So anytime you click an object to be modified, anytime that you submit new text for an issue or, or an, a note on something, that gets submitted into Redis, the, the sidekick queue, which is Redis is the back end, and that gets submitted and then pulled off for processing. This queue is, is a stateful queue in terms of you need to take care about the Redis process. Um, most of you have this writing to disk, that's the base configuration for how this is shipped, so that if you shut it down, it will dump all the contents out to disk, and then when you start it back up, it'll pull them all from disk. Um, We'll talk about some scaling later on. Um, on GitLab.com, we have split the Redis workload into two different queues. One's a cache queue, and one is our stateful queue. And the cache queue, we don't write to disk. It's, if we lose it, it's, it's just cache data that can be cached again. Stateless systems, this would be our UI display. So that's the web nodes that are just running the web front end. Those really have no state to them. Uh, and our processing. So this would be the sidekick nodes. Some of you may or may not be running Psychic nodes independently. This is a feature that you can run independently. Um, but if you're running it on a single node server, restarting the Psychic process uh, is a non-destructive thing that you can do to stop and restart your queue processing. So we've got HA configurations. And I realize that I'm kind of moving fast here. We're gonna take time for questions. If you have questions, please ask them. Um, and we'll come back over with specific things. So, so John, this is yep. Andy. We do have a question. Um, we're happy to convey that now or sure. wait until the end. So, and I think it's relevant in the section. Uh, question is whether console is uh, embedded or included in the omnibus package or separately installed. Yeah, so for, 
for, in the omnibus package today, we do include console and it is, it's installed along with the, the PG database, Postgres database. So um, if you're using the, the, I forget our product names now, but the, so the high availability portion that we the ship with this, we do include console with that. We include console and console agent. Um, and when you set up multiple nodes, they register as console agents of each other to do the console replication. This is, of course, another thing that you could split out independently. We keep it on in the, in the Omnibus install. It's on the Postgres database nodes. So they are running console uh, and console agent to talk to each other for a raft-based algorithm for who's available um, using the gossip protocol. So it's who's available, who's not available, doing health checks on Postgres. Um, and if a Postgres node becomes unhealthy, the console agent pulls it out of console. Let it, that is shipped with Omnibus today. Any more questions? No, nope, that's it for now. Thank you. Okay. What are our stateful components? We're going to look at, so HA is next. Um, this will just be a real brief touch on HA, and then we'll talk about this uh, a little bit afterwards. So one of the common questions that the TAMs were seeing was priority levels for HA consideration, right? What is the most important thing if I'm going to be adding HA to my system that I should be looking at? And so we really feel that database level high availability is something that you should consider first off if you're just starting to look at this and say, well, that's where I should focus my attention. We tried really hard to make the database high availability uh, something that's attainable and easy through use of console and uh, PG Bouncer and Rep Manager so that really all you have to do is you spin up another node, tell it in your GitLab RB configuration that it's going to be running the database function. And then you use a, a GitLab CTL command to register them to each other to let them know that there's two databases. And then what would happen from this is that the second database will uh, automatically receive a configuration that puts it in a follower mode. It'll have a replication slot added to the primary system. And it'll begin replicating data to the secondary system. Uh, when this happens and you've got that set up, then you can go into your GitLab RB configuration on your web nodes and all your other nodes and tell them that you have a multi-database setup. And when you do that, the traffic pattern that I talked about earlier where non-writes, so all your reads and queries will come off of a secondary node and your primary writes will happen on, on, the, the, on the primary database node. Uh, next is Redis. So because this is the, the if, Postgres is the heart of our, our GitLab Omnibus application. Redis is, is the vein structure that, that delivers that blood to the entire system. This is our messaging system for our queue structures, pub cell architecture. This is what distributes the workload throughout the application and makes sure that it gets processed and, and returned back in. We ship today uh, Redis Sentinel with Redis, which allows you to basically run the same type of GitLab CTL commands to have multiple Redis nodes that communicate with each other. Um, there's a similar process inside the configuration to add another Redis node with the GitLab CTL commands. Um, today, that is a non-auto discovery process, right? So you run Omnibus on it, you run the, the commands, the configuration options to tell it that it's gonna be a Redis node, um, and then you put the, the kind of the Redis Sentinel configuration in there, which is in the documentation. And then you start Redis up. And then the, the, the two just see each other, communicate that they should be part of a Redis pool structure together. And then you update your client GitLab RB configurations to say, I have two nodes in my Redis sentence configuration or however many nodes you've added. After that, we move on to the web front end. It's a debate between the web front end and then the, the last one is the sidekick queue processing, right? So um, you want users to be able to reach your site, to be able to uh, do all the things that we've added in, in the UI to get functionality. So uh, checking where milestones are at, issue status, and things like that. Uh, adding web front end availability is, is really easy. Um, it's just literally installing another, another, another box or node or configuration of the Omnibus package uh, and telling it where the database is and, and the other options from the back end. Uh, Sidekick is also an important structure in this in terms of 
you want availability for the job processing that you have. This though leads into uh, later questions about scaling because really adding a second sidekick node is helpful if you just add it by default out of the box. What it's going to give you is duplicate queue processing for all the queues that you have in, on, in Omnibus. And that's very helpful. That means you have two nodes processing all the queue things that you need to do to take information in and out of and process for GitLab. Um, what that gets you is that you can lose a sidekick process or a sidekick node and everything will continue on just fine. Um, one of the things that we'll talk about in a little bit is if you're seeing slowdowns in processing, so adding notes, um, computing milestones or, or burn down charts and things like that, we can add sidekick queue processing to kind of speed that up as part of the scaling. So in scaling GitLab, what we're going to look at are the parts to scale on GitLab. Uh, and then, oh, sorry, moving on here. If there are questions from that last section, you have questions, uh, please feel free to ask them. We do have a question, John. It popped in and uh, was on my mind as well. So, <clears throat> and I think maybe we're going to get a couple more. First question is, in HA architecture, the NFS part, you used to get a shared storage um, and is often the main bottleneck in terms of SLA and resilience from the perspective of the questioner. Uh, so yeah. this have scheduled any evolution or is there any scheduled evolution? I'm trying to sort of uh, translate a little bit here, but is there any evolution uh, for more optionality regarding storage uh, or persistence? Yes. So... Or is there any other option for a separate kind of file system or server other than NFS? <laughs> yeah, so um, let's just stop and talk with you for a bit here. So we've gone through a series of evolutions with storage on GitLab, and, and specifically GitLab.com. So when GitLab.com started, it was a single node architecture. Um, in the history of it, it went to um, DRDB replicated disk. Uh, that worked until it had to scale a whole lot larger. Uh, it then went to NFS backend with a single, single NFS backend and multiple front end workers. That, you know, a, 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 as you've pointed out, that works until it doesn't um, because it is a bottleneck for scaling. The next piece where we went from there is a question that uh, somebody submitted to a TAM about have you looked at things like Ceph and CephFS or other large, um, large storage file systems that present themselves as a single POSIX file system to, to the guest system. And we have, we actually spent about five to six months uh, implementing and rolling out and, and using CephFS as a centralized storage backend. What we found was that that added an inordinate amount of complexity to the configuration. It's, it's not impossible. Um, if you already have people that are Ceph experts and CephFS ex experts in your shop, and you're running on bare metal or, or in environments that you control, it might be an option for you. Um, for us, running Ceph with CephFS on top of it in the public cloud, um, we became the noisy neighbor. And we have blog posts about this where the IO write load that we were uh, subjecting our, our cloud provider to was so high to the degree that, that they began introducing IO wait latencies to us because we were the noisy neighbor affecting other people. So if you've got your own, if you're running this on-prem and, you, and you've got already expertise in this, it's a decent way to go. Um, one of the things that we're trying to do, and we are doing through a product, an open source product that we're writing called Giddily, is to get around this. So today we, well, I should say, in, pause and roll back. In the evolution, when Ceph didn't work for us, we implemented NFS sharding. So NFS sharding is currently in the application today. And so what that allows you to do is stand up multiple NFS servers and tell your uh, GitLab installation that you have multiple NFS servers for sharding across. And then as new, new repos get created, they'll be, get created in, in a random round robin access order across them. Uh, and the database will keep track of where they are. Now, this still leaves you with a single point of failure in that you just now have an NFS server serving a repository. Um, and that's one of the things that 
you know, most on-prem sites uh, use an NFS appliance. So it'll be either be something like, you know, an, an EMC, uh, you know, an EMC file system or uh, I'm losing my mind on the, the popular brick and stack competitor to that. Um, but an NFS appliance so that it's gated behind like an HA uh, NFS front end that's actually pushing it out to multiple storage on the back end. Where we're going from this on the next side of this is an open source offering called Giddily. And Giddily is um, a service-based architecture where we're removing NFS and Git from the front end nodes. So we're gonna create Giddily storage pools. These storage pools serve much the same action as like the NFS servers, but you don't have to mount them up with NFS. There'll be a Giddily process that communicates to the Giddily server. There's no NFS mounting. Um, and that's, that's version one of that. We're, we're just about rounded out on that. The next version of that will be to take care of replication and sideways replication inside of that to bring HA so that we can do um, get distribution across the back end for high availability and, and disaster avoidance without you having to mount up and access multiple stores. So that's kind of the, the, the path to that. Yeah. So John, this, uh, let me add question two to this, uh, which is you know, really the second part. Question two, to be more specific, does GitLab schedule some evolution to support more or different shared file systems than FS? I think you answered that. Like SMB version 3.0 shared file system, Linux kernel 4.1.1 supporting SMB version 3.0? Yeah, so to, to really answer that, um, from the standpoint of GitLab, um, it, it doesn't care. So all you need to present to GitLab is a, is a POSIX standard based file system. So you can present that over NFS, you can present it over SMB. Um, however you wanna do that, it just has to be a POSIX based file system that you're presenting to GitLab. So if you wanna do SMB, SMB v3 shares um, to like the web front end nodes and, and the Git nodes and stuff like that, that's perfectly doable. You can do that if you want to. It just, the, the only requirement there is that you have to be presenting a, a POSIX based file system to GitLab. Perfect, perfect, and I think you're uh, I think you also answered the one of evolution, which is when you spoke to Giddily mm -hmm. as a roadmap sort of item. Okay. Uh, that's all that's in the queue for now. All right. So I'll go back and share my screen here and we'll pop back into this. So when we talk about scaling on-prem, one of the things that we talk about is a good HA front end. So for us, we, we use HA proxy as the HA front end and for internal um, load balancing scaling. Uh, I, I can't stress enough what adding a good load balancer in the front of this will let you do in terms of scaling your web traffic, being able to separate out API traffic, being able to separate out Git traffic, uh, and, and, and really let you break the components up and scale this. Um, for those of you that don't know, uh, GitLab.com, right now is not anything different than what you could buy and scale on-prem. GitLab.com is the GitLab EE version. We take it from the Debian repo, the same as anybody else could do. And we use Chef to just multiply that and, and, and spread it around. And then we apply our configurations to it so that only specific nodes are running specific jobs, tasks, and functions. And they're being routed to through a front end load balancer. The next on this is Sidekick queue splitting. So, Sidekick, like we said, is the worker process that takes things out of the queue, processes them, and brings them back in. So that's all of your Git operations, all of your notes, um, merge requests, all of that, CI jobs, those are all Sidekick queue spun and run, right? The ability to take this Sidekick queue and split it out is one of the things that people don't really realize they can do, but it adds immense flexibility and scale for functionality. This is really handy if you have, say you've got, even in a single node instance where you've got a single node, but things are taking a long time to process because you've got a lot of people making merge requests and, and looking at diffs, asking for diff requests, creating issues, you might be pulling on things with, with a, a bot um, or submitting and, and generating runs. What splitting your sidekick queues out does 
is enables you to have more processing power to process those tasks that are getting put in the queue. And we'll touch on that in, in a little bit. Uh, NFS sharding and an NFS appliance. So I, I kind of talked about this. Um, currently today inside of GitLab, we NFS shard. So we have currently 24 NFS shards right now. Um, we generate a new, we generate four new shards at a time. We generate a new shard anytime the file system is approaching a little over 60% full. So when the file systems get 60% full, we generate new NFS nodes um, and then limit new repo and project creation to the new NFS nodes and leave the old nodes just for growth and scale of the current structure. Now inside uh, GitLab today, we know that's a single point of failure. So what we do is we have internal scripts that go around and snapshot all the disk backends of those things and keep snapshots of what the disk state was uh, inside our cloud provider so that we can have rollback events to those. Uh, and then NFS appliance. So if you're an on-prem shop and you are doing NFS, uh, somebody mentioned SMB v3, that protocol's come a long way since people have reverse engineered that, made it available, and especially since it's been incorporated into the kernel. Um, those are all great options. And if you have an appliance to do that, a lot of the, I say appliance because a lot of times it's easier to get an appliance uh, and have that be pre-tuned for high IOPS and availability than it is to spend engineering time um, to, to do that for you. And then multiple database nodes. Uh, like we talked about in the front end, when you have multiple database nodes, we offload a lot of the database processing. So a lot of the reads that can be intensive go to follower nodes and just the right functions or time sensitive functions go to the primary node. So I mentioned sidekick queue splitting. This is a function that we rolled out, I want to say in the later version of GitLab 8 and for sure in GitLab 9. Um, so queue list can be found in sidekick underscore queues dot yaml. If you don't want to go digging through that, um, there's the actual master config right there. This is a list of all the sidekick queues. So every time that we have a specific function that we're going to be executing inside of GitLab, it has a queue and, and, and a named queue. We do that so that we can keep track of how we process this work and, and roll through handling it through our systems. What we internally do at GitLab is we split all these out. So we have to process the workload for GitLab.com today, we have roughly 35 sidekick nodes doing various sidekick functions. This is enabled through the sidekick cluster function in your deployment. So this is an option inside your GitLab RB that you can turn on. And when you turn it on, it takes Q groups. And all a Q group is is a bracketed set of those queues that you want to run. So if you're looking for specific discrete processing, so you say, man, <coughs> merge requests take a, a long time. I got a lot of merge request load. People are doing a lot of merge requests. I need to, to find a way to clear this out quicker. You can spin up additional sidekick nodes. So you start with an omnibus install. You tell the omnibus install in the GitLab RB that it doesn't need to run anything else except sidekick cluster. So you say, you know, disable you know, faults to all the start preprocesses. And you say true to sidekick cluster. Inside the sidekick cluster, sidekick cluster, that's a mouthful, queue groups, you then specify the queues that pertain to the MR functionalities. This lets, you know, it, it will connect to the Redis cluster and it'll begin polling just like anything else. And then this lets you flush that queue out with greater uh, reactiveness than just having one sidekick queue node that is running all the queue groups. So within GitLab, we have several different nodes that we specify. So we have one called ASAP, which that's one where we run sidekick queue uh, queues on that are all the AS, like do this as soon as possible. So those are things like when I add a node, this needs to be processed immediately. When I add an issue comment that needs to be processed immediately. When I do some Git functions, those need to be processed immediately. We have a best effort queue, which is like, well, you know, when, when this can happen, make this happen. Um, and then we've split out because for us, uh, helping people manage their products and, and, and how they've gotten to or replicate from GitLab.com is important to us. So we have specific queue nodes that do nothing but process imports. We have queue nodes that do nothing but process Git replications. 
Um, so those are all things that you can branch and split out. And uh, so if you're looking at horizontal scaling, this is a great way to get into that and, and start uh, adding some real gas to your GitLab instance. Uh, one of the things that the TAMs got asked was NFS requirements. Like how, how do you know, what do you look at when you look at NFS requirements and, and how do you know what's speedy and what's not? Um, there are several key factors to just really tried and true methods uh, that we've looked at a long time in the industry for various reasons. Um, so they're IOPS, so input output operations per second. Uh, and then the other one would be IO weight. So how many operations can your base underlying file system do per second? That's a high order. Um, and then are you experiencing IO weight when those operations happen? So do you have to incur a write delay? Um, are you seeing write queue weights? Things like that. And then for future state on our NFS nodes or, or storage nodes, as we're moving to call them, we want to look at CPU load. This is for Giddily because what's going to happen is when Giddily comes into play, which is already in, in use on GitLab.com, and it's a beta feature. You can choose to use it on your uh, Omnibus install today because we do ship it with GitLab Omnibus. The actual Git processes are uh, ran and transacted on the storage nodes. So previously where we just had storage nodes that were only had to have the requirement of, of serving up NFS uh, over the network. Now when we're moving to Gitly, they also have to do Git functionality. So Git packs, Git repacks, um, any of the Git maintenance, those are things that are, are processor intensive that you need to make sure that you're accounting for if you're building new architecture and you want to use the Gitly functionality. All right, John, if I can uh, take you back. I sure. believe, yeah, the question popped in. I think it's related to the queue splitting. And the question is, is this part of the premium edition? No. The right so, content. Yep. So queue, queue splitting, um, I would have to look. I'm, I'm positive that that functionality exists in the GitLab CE all the way down in CE. That is uh, a functionality that we've, it's, it's a little wrapper that we wrote for Sidekick called Sidekick Cluster. Um, and that is something that, that I, I'm almost positive anybody can do in their GitLab RB configuration. And there's, there's not a license key required to do that. That's just some base functionality. Excellent. So uh, just to add to that, assuming uh, we've interpreted the question correctly, uh, is it as simple as adding the YAML file for Sidekick Q or Sidekick underscore Q's YAML? That. Well, so yeah, so let me go back and explain that. That, uh, that YAML file is there by default. We ship it as part of the instruction set in the, in the base GitLab configuration, right? I referenced that to tell you that, that if you were looking for how do I know what the queue name is, right? What, what are the queue names that are in play? Those are all referenced in that YAML file. Um, actually, let me go back. You a great example of the file uh, out there in your, in your yep. deck. So if you look at this, move this over. Uh, this is a, just our YAML file. And this is going to enumerate all the different queues that we have. Um, you'll see in here that when we do, we, we consume this, we attach weight to them. So the application knows which queues are more important and a priority to uh, attach to them. But this is all the queues that the actual GitLab application consumes. So, you know, the expire for builds, the authorization of projects, everything from mail handling, there's a queue for emails on push, right? So if, if you need to prioritize one of these, um, it's easy to go in here, look at what these queue structures are, and then uh, add them to your GitLab RB. Um, gotcha. Excellent. Yeah, so there's a follow-up question. Sure. Uh, and that is, um, how are dead jobs handled in Sidekick? Uh, so dead jobs in terms of when a job isn't completed and it's just expired? I, that's all I've got to go on. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but I, I think that's a fair interpretation. Yeah. So, there's, yeah, so there's, we have implemented a, a layer on that. So Redis is just the, uh, 
back in for that and we use Sidekick. Sidekick has job completion and, and, and we track to see whether or not when, so when a node pulled the job out, that has a job ID and that job ID is held uh, until the node comes back and says, I finished that job. There's a timeout period on, on that Sidekick process, right? So if um, a job ID is pulled out, the node's not returning it back, um, then we'll, we'll run a timeout. The timeout, I think the timeout's high. I think it's like 15 minutes. Uh, and then we'll, that job will be up for, for grab for somebody else. So there, there is locking on job IDs. Right. But there's not, um, <clears throat> is there a concept of uh, an orphaned job that is persistent, you know, uh, durable across reboots? Or is there anything that kind of gets orphaned uh, in the overall stack that could be lingering and can't get rid of? No, there shouldn't be. Um, and, and that's why I said that the psychic nodes were stateless in that sense, right? So there shouldn't be. Sometimes it, it I mean, software is software, and sometimes it has a mind of its own. Um, we have experienced cases where, for whatever reason, a job idea gets stuck in a psychic queue. Um, those are cases where it is safe to just go ahead and flush the queue. So you can just restart psychic on that to flush out that hung job, and it'll move right along. Beautiful. All right. Carry on. That's, that's all we got in the queue right now. Um, so front end load balancing. People have asked us, what do we use for load balancing? Uh, lots and lots of HA proxy. So we use HA proxy on the front end of GitLab.com. We use it for high availability. Uh, we use it for some rate limiting for our API. And we use it for role separation. Uh, if you're interested in looking at what we do, uh, I'll, I'll touch on this later on. All of how we manage gitlab.com is done via Chef. And that's all public to you. So if you go to gitlab.com slash gitlab dash cookbooks, uh, that's all the cookbooks that we use to manage all of our internal infrastructure and gitlab.com and how we roll things out. This particular one, the gitlab dash HA proxy, is the cookbook that we use to manage the front end HA proxy. So if you were to look in that in the default templates, you would see a lot of the magic that we use to split things out. <coughs> so one of the things that we do is we have some HA proxy configuration that looks at the URL that you've tried to access. And then we split that based upon some base URL pathing. So if the URL deals with a series of Git transactions, those are, are handed off to a backend that is just Git nodes, that all they do is process Git transactions, whether they're SSH, or whether they're coming in via the HTTPS front end, but it's a Git transaction on the front end. So like, this is how we split out web UI functionality for clicking around in the interface versus I'm making an HTTPS Git transaction. We split that so that the front end web UI nodes don't handle that. That's all done with HA proxy. We also split our API traffic off. So if you're accessing a URL that is API centric, that goes to a different cluster of backends that handle just API traffic. And then on that, we apply some rate limiting. We, we apply rate limiting that limits how many concurrent sessions you can have per second to our API. This prevents us from uh, being overrun and overloaded our API. And it lets us keep a pulse and handle on the abusers of that, uh, as well as uh, how we need to scale that if we're getting hot. And then, like I said, role separation. This is where we've talked, I talked about, we use that HA proxy magic to separate out we have Git nodes that we redirect the SSH traffic to, and then the, the HTTPS Git workload. We have our front end uh, web nodes that we just handle all the, the UI stuff on and UI only. Uh, we have API nodes, um, and then we're gonna be spinning up, uh, this is on our, my, my pull sheet this week, is API nodes uh, solely for CI traffic. Uh, so the, the, what you can separate out there is, is pretty flexible. We love HA proxy for that reason. Um, so there's, there's a lot of little magic happening in that cookbook if you're inclined to look at that. Uh, so keeping track of it all, I wanted to touch on this just because I think it's important. Um, we use Prometheus monitoring. We use Prometheus monitoring and alert management to monitor all of our systems. Um, we ship Prometheus inside of GitLab Omnibus um, the default configuration for that today is evolving. So right now, the internal Prometheus lets you manage, the, lets you look at and monitor the internal GitLab guts of the application, right? So 
Um, we're shipping more and more templates. I think right now you should be able to, out of the box with GitLab monitoring, be able to look at your Sidekick queue structures, um, what their, their queue depth is on those, uh, and uh, things around HTTP response times inside our application. So how long does it take the application to respond to a request and things like that. Those are all things we're shipping internally and we're continuing to push out. Now we at gitlab.com take that Prometheus portion of it, set it aside and then like scale it bigger. So we have <coughs> three nodes for monitoring all of our infrastructure. We have two additional nodes for monitoring uh, like application statistics because the, we're beginning to instrument the applications with telemetry reporting so that they can actually give us data about what's happening inside the application that we're monitoring. All this we feed into Prometheus's alert manager and the alert manager helps us roll up, you know, what is the threshold for an alert? Can I aggregate alerts? Um, if I've seen this alert too many times, that's a problem. If I haven't seen enough data on this alert, it's a problem. All that's flexible and configurable and we use the alert manager for that. The alert manager takes two different prongs for us. Um, we have a lot of Slack integrations. So in Slack channels, the alert manager pings somebody, lets them know that uh, you know, there's a potential problem or that things uh, need someone's attention. And then when they reach a criticality state, uh, before they reach criticality, we, try to, we pull out to pager duty. So we page an engineer to take care of the problem. Um, if you haven't looked at the Prometheus that's, that's included in monitoring for GitLab, I would advise you to do so. The Prometheus uh, methodology for monitoring is really slick. Uh, and uh, there's a lot that you can do there. If you have ever wandered over to monitor.gitlab.com, which is a, a public uh, Grafana and Prometheus instance that we have that we're working on scaling up more, you can see um, the public spacing side, which is just the same as our internals, of all the monitoring that we do for the application. So queue timings for gitlab.com, um, how we look at a lot of the dashboards that we've crafted to look at things, those are all there as well. <coughs> and then um, I forgot to include it on here, but we also have a repo of all of the Grafana dashboards that we've built to look at GitLab.com. So that, those are public as well. And then the second thing that I think is, is highly important is uh, managing configuration. So we... Um, We use configuration as code. And by that, what we mean is that every node that runs any part of our system, it's not hand tooled. We don't manually go type that into the GitLab RB and, and put that out there. We use Chef. And this is the cookbooks that I was alluding to earlier. So every portion of our infrastructure, um, how we care and feed for it, how we expand sysctl options, uh, how we, everything from LVM, all, all of our LVM configuration dismounts is managed through Chef. And that's all in our GitLab cookbooks. We, we believe that that should be the, the sole source of truth for things. And we use our own internal GitLab product and Git revisioning for how we apply things to GitLab. Uh, keeping it running. So one of the questions that the TAMS got asked was, when do you patch systems? So at GitLab, every Monday, uh, we do systems patching. And then if the system patching calls for reboots, those are scheduled so that they occur staggered and aren't uh, customer facing. So a lot of the ones that we do for like web front end nodes, um, we'll cycle through the HA proxy and pull a node out, reboot it, put it back in and just move through them uh, in an automated fashion. Uh, and then if it's other things, um, so we'll pull database nodes out, reboot them and put them back in. And that's all made easier using the console and with dynamic adding and, and uh, host discovery. And then as you guys know, uh, we do release candidates when they're available to gitlab.com and then the final product release happens the 22nd day of every month. <clears throat> All right. Questions? Yeah, so we've got, we've got a couple. Um, let's start with uh, the first one that came in. Kind of let this one queue up a little bit. Uh, it's to do with logging. So. A lot of troubleshooting requires going through logs to find the cause of errors. We only run a four node HA cluster and are using syslog to centralize the logs. Do you do something different for gitlab.com? 
So <laughs> the, that's been in uh, iteration for us. So where's my screen share? Zoom. There we go. Yeah, so that's been an iteration for us. So up until fairly recently, uh, we've used uh, syslog and we've streamed it all back to an elk cluster. So everything goes back to an elk cluster. So we're running the Elasticsearch, um, you know, Logstash and Kibana. And that's what we do internally for that. We recently modified that um, to, as part of moving to Google, which hopefully you're all aware of, we modified that. So in our current structure, because we're, we're leveraging um, GCP and some of the things that are there, we're pushing all that into Google stack driver right now. But prior to that, um, and it worked very well for us, we used the elk stack. So we would just use syslog, stream them all to an elk cluster, and then look at our logs that way. Excellent. All right. Um, next question here is, have you tried to use Azure Load Balancer instead of HA Proxy? And do you have any customer feedback on that? So, yeah, so we're currently in Azure. Um, the Azure Load Balancer is a very basic load balancer. The only thing it can give you is, is the TCP port available downstream and should you route traffic to it? Um, if you look at what we're doing inside, um, the cookbooks that we have for HA proxy, I mean, we're, we're doing regex based upon the URL pass structure. Um, we're doing rate limiting checks on how many times we've seen somebody from a, from a specific IP address accessing a URL. So those are things that, that we can't get out of the Azure load balancer today. Um, in addition to that, we used to front end our database nodes with an Azure load balancer. And uh, unfortunately we found that when we removed the load balancer, uh, we we achieved a, a an entire factor of, of improvement on access times to the, the database nodes that were behind that. So we haven't had good success with that. Um, and when we move to Google, we're going to change some of that. They're, they're, the load balancers there are better. So some of the functionality we pushed out into um, a GCP load balancer uh, will move to Google. And but some of the other functionality in terms of advanced route splitting and stuff. The regex matching inside the GCP load, uh, layer seven load balancer just isn't there yet. So we kind of have to keep some of that in house. Um, but that's a great question. All right. That's all we've got in the, in the queue at the moment. All right. Let me move back to this presentation. I think I've just got one or two more screens here and then we'll go back into some uh, other questions or did I close that? No, here we go. All right. And then, oh, well, one of the things that gets asked of us is how do we deploy GitLab? So if you, if you hit a magical, you know, compendium of things and like work like us, so if you use Chef and you want to do multi-node uh, deployments, uh, or if you're just looking for pointers about how we automate this, we have an open source tool that we wrote uh, called GitLab Takeoff. And uh, it's, you know, free for you to use, take, modify, you know, do whatever you want with it. But it does some basic things for us. And we've just chosen to automate those inside of, of a little wrapper that helps us do that. Some of the basic stuff that we do in Takeoff is we warm up the deployment by pre-downloading the package to all the nodes. Um, and then we go through this process where we stop the services if we need to. So if we're doing a change that we need to stop sidekick processing before we, uh, you know, execute the change, or if we need to stop, for example, like mailroom sending out mail notifications while we're processing the change, we can do that with flags that are in our takeoff thing. I mean, it's just a series of automating these steps so that they have, but this is where we deploy the, the way we deploy code. Uh, Next, we deploy to the web nodes and perform DB migration. So in a deploy chain, how we're deploying code is we hit the web nodes and we do the DB migrations. When we do this, we're using one of the features that we ship with Omnibus, which is skip post-deployment migrations. So this lets you just deploy the code, just do the database migration that's needed um, to, to add new tables, columns, rows, and modify the database for 
the code is going to be running on the web nodes. Then we deploy to Sidekick, we deploy to the Giddily nodes, uh, we restart services if they need to be started again. And then after all that's done, then we do the post migration process. So we run the, the deploy again, and we don't use the skip post deployment migrations. And so those are all the things where if we had database app operations that we need to perform. So if we were going to mass modify something, add a default to a lot of things, stuff like that, then we let that happen after we've upgraded everything so that it can kind of process in the background. Some of these post deployment migrations can take 20, 30 minutes. Um, as of uh, GitLab 10.5, we uh, put a lot of these in batch scheduling. So if we're going to take a long time, we just schedule them as batches. But that's kind of the order in which we deploy GitLab. Um, as you guys, if you're consumers of GitLab.com, sometimes this works well. Sometimes we hit a snag. Um, we are trying very hard to reduce the times we get a snag. And that was all the pre-canned slides I had. So I would like to open it up now. If you have questions, freeform questions, let's just go ahead and uh, finish out our remaining time with some fireside chat. All right. Yeah, we did have one pop in, one last one, which I think is a good question here is, will takeoff be integrated into GitLab CI CD projects? So takeoff is really used to just deploy GitLab.com. Um, the CI CD projects that we're using today, we're trying to go a, a different route with those, and that's through Kubernetes integration and uh, our product called Auto DevOps. Um, Auto DevOps, if you're, if you're tracking what we're doing there, um, looks at the code that you have in the repository, uh, uses some heuristics to see if we can understand what kind of application type you're actually got. Is this a Ruby on Rails project? Is it a Node.js project? Things like that. And then uh, help you spin up nodes if you would like um, to facilitate that. So that's, that's where the CI CD route's going is auto DevOps um, with heuristics based upon what your coach you committed to help you give everything from if you want to just let us make the choices for you to um, saying, hey, this is the application, I've noticed this, and I'd like to hear some stubs to help you start. That's where CI CD is going. Takeoff really is just an, an, an app that we wrote to help us deploy GitLab.com faster, to try and reduce downtime, to try and get it done faster, to try and bring more stability to the deployment process so that users of GitLab.com are affected less. All right, thank you. That's all we've got in the queue, so Back to your uh, suggestion, I believe. All right. So if anybody has any questions about horizontal, vertical um, scaling, please feel free to ask them. Uh, I'm just going to walk through some things that some of the TAMs have submitted as questions uh, that they have seen for the remainder of the time. So like I said, if you have questions, feel free to ask them. Um, and one of the questions that uh, I'm just going to pull off this list here is, uh, which AWS services can be used for HA rather than maintaining traditional VM no roles or nodes? Um, all are alternatives to running things like your own Postgres. So yes, one of the things that you can use is you can use um, Amazon's uh, database offering if you don't want to run your own database. We have some constraints around that um, in terms of what versions are supported because we do some version specific things. But if you look in the omnibus release notes, we'll always tell you the minimum version that you should be using and when that aligns with the offering inside of Azure um, or AWS or Google, uh, you can use that. Uh, and another question is, is networking fully isolated between nodes in GitLab.com, or do nodes share a VPC subnet freely with just an external firewall? So in GitLab.com today, we actually do have uh, isolation, uh, and we run firewalls between things. So the web nodes can't talk back into other nodes. They can only talk back into the database. Um, the Git nodes can only talk to the file system and, and to the API that they, they pull their Git functions from. So all of that is, is segmented into their own separate subnets with firewalls that have you know, holes poked through. The follow-on question of that was, uh, is the product change enough to make strict port isolation uh, hard to manage? And the answer to that is no. So 
The only thing you have to be mindful there of is if you're using NFS, you need to go in and put the NFS requirements in to use specific static ports instead of dynamic ports for NFS. Other than that, the ports that we use commonly for the application, we don't change. We try, try not to introduce uh, change like that without letting you know in advance. Uh, one of the questions from uh, the chat was, have you tried using, <coughs> Martin Ramirez asked, have you tried using other market HA appliances like F5 or others? We have not. Um, we have a strong belief and core structure that we want to use and support open source products. So we use HA proxy as an open source uh, product and where we see uh, deficiencies in that, we try to contribute back to that source uh, for them. Uh, Anonymous asks, is there a link for it? I'm not sure what you're asking for a link for. I think somebody asked this is being recorded. It is being recorded, and I believe that we'll be providing a link uh, post. That's correct, yep. Uh, wow. I think, uh, well, I'm going to give this a try. Uh, Sigis uh, asks, I know you mentioned doing snapshots for the data nodes. Do you also concurrently do database nodes too? Does the storage and database backups need to be done at the same time? So we do something different for the database nodes. We use uh, an open source uh, package called Wally that does uh, streaming. So inside Postgres, Postgres writes uh, what's called wall segments of the continuous data that it's processing. Wally takes those wall segments as the database is writing them and streams them to a destination if you're choosing. So we use Wally to do real time per minute log shipping, basically, of Postgres to an S3 storage bucket so that we can do incremental restore to the database down to the minute. So we do a, a nightly full Wally backup, and then as the database is operating, we do real time Wally streams. Um, if you want to look at how that's configured, how we do that, um, inside the GitLab cookbooks, there's a GitLab Wally cookbook that, you know, is how we install Wally on our database nodes and how we use PGP to encrypt all that and ship it off to Amazon S3. Um, the second part of your question, do they need to be done at the same time? No, they don't. Uh, we try to do them at around the same time. We take database snapshots and, and, and do the, because we're doing permanent incrementals on the database, we kind of have a high level of granularity. Um, but try to keep them closed just because <coughs> you are storing some cache data about hash references stuff inside the database. Uh, and then have you tried, sorry, Thomas asks, have you tried Azure Redis cache, Azure PostgreSQL database? Uh, do you have feedback? Um, we have made tries at those. Um, they work okay for small to medium installs. Um, the tuning that we're doing for level of vacuuming, row cleanup, um, how our database is replicating stuff like that, that's not really something that, that fits within the Azure Postgres like hosted model or their Redis cache, um, but at, at the size that we're operating at. If you are a much smaller size, those certainly are options that you can use, um, and, and they do have some great functionality to them. I don't see any more of the questions in the queue. We've got two minutes, so feel free to ask something if you like, or, does, or, we, or we have more minutes, I'm not sure. <laughs> um, yeah, so I'm not sure if we've got one minute or not. Uh, so I'll just plunk through this until somebody cuts me off. We have oh. 15 minutes. Oh, okay. So 15 minutes, so if you have any, any questions you wanna ask, be they esoteric, crazy, uh, why or why not? What do you want to know? Let's go through those. Um, and in absence of that, uh, I'll just go to the next question that was submitted by Tam, which was, how does GitLab use GitLab HAGO? So we kind of talked about the HA perspective of that, how we're doing high availability Postgres, high availability Redis with Redis Sentinel, and uh, our Postgres with uh, Rep Manager and PG Bouncer. Um, the Geo is kind of a new thing for us. We're in the process of moving to Google from Azure as a backend cloud provider. And currently GitLab is leveraging 
GitLab Geo right now to do that migration for us. So all of our issues, repositories, uploads, storage, we're using our GitLab Geo product to keep Google currently in sync with the Azure deployment of GitLab. So right now, there is a fully stood up version of GitLab.com in Google, and it's in near real-time replication. And we are in the final stages of working on the cutover for that. So we are just practicing right now. In fact, tomorrow morning we'll have another practice where we practice um, cutting over a, an environment. So we're taking our staging environment of GitLab.com and practicing a cutover of that data to Google staging environment. And uh, all that's being done using the geo product, the geo processes and uh, the geo scripts. And we're continuing to refine that process and finish the development of like some of the finer details of that product. And that will be what we use uh, towards the end of this month to migrate GitLab.com from Microsoft Azure to Google. Uh, somebody else asked what benefit, another Tam question was, what benefit does using HA roles provide? Um, the HA roles, I think, as we described them in our HA documentation, is around um, whether or not you're, the degree of segmentation that you're using inside the application. So this goes back to, do you just need to have multiple web front ends, and, you know, to, to handle the number of concurrent users or just bring high availability to being able to take down a web node? Do you need to have more than one database node? And then the HA roles there are uh, database, Redis, uh, psychic processing, like we talked about in, in the thing. Uh, Martin Ramirez says, looks forward to a copy of the slides. Yeah, these slides are publicly available uh, and uh, we'll be putting them out there afterwards. Um, another Tam question is, uh, are there ways to isolate a core group of users or use cases against abuse or high load from other areas of the business? Uh, how do we keep mission critical use cases going or prioritize them? Um, I'm, I'm not sure. If, if the TAM that submitted this is on the call, I would love to have it more fleshed out. By users, are you meaning specific GitLab users inside the application or? I'm not sure. Yep, yeah, sorry, John, I don't, I don't have any help for you on this one. I'm not sure who submitted it, but um, it does point to some of the throttling capability I've seen in uh, the instance level uh, related to uh, I guess you could say autom malicious automation, for example. Sure. Hacking crawlers, et cetera. I don't, I don't know that that's what this question was geared for, but you may be able to speak to some of it in that way, keeping that sort of traffic activity uh, to a minimum. Right. So today we, uh, we use HA proxy to limit Angela.com at concurrent access to the API. Um, the rest of the application, we don't have uh, that level of throttling in front of at an external application. Internally, inside the GitLab application, and this is true for all of you that are running GitLab, um, we ship a product, an open source product inside there called Rack Attack. And we've got Rack Attack configured to help mitigate abuse case scenarios that you might see. So when people um, rapidly make submissions, Rack Attack will throttle them out. Uh, when they've got rapid click points in terms of, you know, it looks like somebody's automated a, a rapid click through to add a comment or a note or uh, something, we'll throttle that. Um, so those are some of the inbuilt things. Uh, if you look in the documentation for Rack Attack, uh, you'll be able to see the configurations that we have inside of that. We're trying to expose more of those configurations through the GitLab admin interface. So currently, you can tune, you know, at what level you want to, to throttle somebody for rapidly, you know, consuming your GitLab instance and stuff like that. More of those settings are going to bubble up um, as we, we begin to expose those into the application. We, we have another one that came in uh, in the queue here, and that's, do you have user level document 
for setting up HA GitLab instance uh, for on-prem? Yeah, we actually do. So uh, in the, the post notes about this, uh, we'll, we can include a link. Um, if you just Google GitLab HA, uh, the second link that you're going to find is our documentation for the administrators on how to configure GitLab HA and what GitLab HA looks like uh, with following steps, all the way from configuring the database to configuring Redis, adding additional nodes and load balancers. Um, that's all in docs.gitlab.com. So that's covered in there. Um, so if you're looking for an administrator standpoint to how to walk through that, um, and look at either everything from a hybrid configuration all the way up to, you know, the fully distributed configuration that GitLab.com runs. Uh, that's that's documented in there with how to configure each of those steps. That's all the questions that I had from Tams, uh, and I see no other questions in the queue. So I'm going to hand this back to Andy. If we have more questions that come in, I'll be happy to ask them. But uh, if we don't, thank you for attending this fireside. It's been a pleasure talking with you. And uh, thanks for using GitLab. Thanks, John. Yeah, that was uh, great information. We have out of this, we'll definitely send a link to the recorded version of this session. So you'll be able to go back and, and parse through, pick out the things that are of interest to you. And if you have any additional questions, uh, you may send that to, wow, where should we send that? Uh, let's see, let me consult my Oracle <laughs> momentarily. Okay, yes, of course. Very intuitively, you should send any further questions to your TAM, um, assuming you know who that is. I'm sure you all do. So if they're follow-on, send to the TAM and expect an email from your TAM regarding the recorded session. Uh, thanks for joining, folks. Appreciate it. John, thank you. Expertise uh, goes a long way, so it's useful to get that perspective. All right. Have a great afternoon, everyone, and we'll see you next time around. Cheers. Thanks.